All in favor of safety glasses, say aye. This is Delta Delta, 1400 security. You are listening to Ground Radio. So, sorry, I'm a little bit late. I just got home from work, and I had to hop in the shower because I was a horrible mess. I hate the summer. If it wasn't for the illnesses of the winter, I think the summer would be the absolute worst season of the four. The weather is absolutely brutal this week, I'll admit. But you sound like a killjoy when you say you hate summer. I know. Because society brings you up as a child and everyone's looking forward to the summer because then all of a sudden you don't have those what you considered responsibilities and you're off. And obviously summer's great because you can do whatever you want for the most part. It's true. Everything has a more lackadaisical attitude in the summertime. You know, in Europe, how they have the siestas all year round. I feel like in the summer, that's where you're most likely to get away with some kind of lifestyle like that. The heat is aggravating. The bugs are terrible. Cutting the grass. I just hate every aspect of it. And I prefer winter. It's just logistically winter is a pain because of, you know, if there's ice on the road, then it's dangerous. And then everyone's getting sick, like I said. (laughs) But fall and spring are far more superior to summer. And the worst part about it, the job that I have, it's basically like a factory setting. Okay. So I'm wearing my hard hat and safety glasses and earplugs and boots and pants. So it adds insult to injury, would you say? When it's so hot and you decide, oh, I'm going to just put my jeans on now because I have to go to work, it makes it far more miserable. But I have to do it because safety precautions. Don't get me wrong. I have a big problem with the weather in the summer, too. I just have this guilt when the weather's nice that I'm supposed to go outside or I'm supposed to somehow take advantage of this weather that doesn't come around (laughs) that often. Go out and enjoy yourself. That's why, to me, winter is so much fun because there's absolutely no guilt if you just sit in the house all day and veg out and it's like, well, I had no choice. (laughs) This is the hand I was dealt today. But really, it's what I prefer, too. It's out of my hands. But now, whenever the sun's up early and out late, you have to jam-pack that day with a bunch of stuff you really don't want to do anyway. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes it's just projects that you couldn't get to until the weather cooperates. Mm-hmm. But I feel you. Even when I cut the grass myself, you know, you're supposed to wear closed-toed shoes. You're supposed to have safety goggles on. Now, I, I mean, nobody's going to wear a helmet to do that. But, you know, even when I'm weed-whacking, I should be wearing pants, and I don't. And it hurts. I get hit with pebbles and stuff. Wow. You are brave. You are a wild man. I don't mean to be brave. It's just I don't want to. <laughs> the, the misery that you're going through is because your job requires it. Yeah. And they should. There's a reason for it. And when I'm at home, I run by my own standards. You're the boss of this rodeo, and you will decide to wear shorts even though you're flinging rocks at the speed of sound. Ugh, and it smarts, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> it, not smarts enough, apparently, but ugh. Of course it does. I'm very paranoid with my eyes. I will wear safety glasses at my house, which I know a lot of people don't, even with my hobbies. And I will for weed whacking. I won't for just cutting the grass. Okay. I I don't feel like the safety glasses would help me much with the lawnmower, but I do wear boots and I I think sometimes I wear shorts, but not when I'm weed whacking. If I had the weed whacker on, I'd wear pants. When you cross the lawnmower over that spot between the lawn and the road where, like, there's sediment and salt from the winter, like, all that stuff that sits there, Mm -hmm. that kicks up enough where I've been hit in the face before by the lawnmower doing its thing. I'm lucky I don't have to deal with that anymore. I got a nice, clean edge on the sidewalk. Gotcha. Growing up in my old house, I had that. And I just hurt myself all the time as a kid. I didn't care back then. Now, you know, whenever I get a bruise, it lasts for six or seven days yeah i have aches and pains and bruises that i can't even explain so healing it doesn't work out the same no not at all it's a totally different formula when you're in your 30s apparently and i think it's going to continue to degrade in that direction it's it's far more expensive too yeah if i get hurt now it seems like it costs a lot more especially because now i actually have to pay not my parents yeah yeah hopefully i get hurt at work (laughs) Yes, well, you have a workman's comp to thank for that. We have a lot of things in place now to stop companies from exploiting their workers. Back in the 1800s, miners and railroad workers were losing limbs and getting injured and just dying in droves. 
it was scary. And the companies could afford it. The average payment was six months pay. And to them, that was considered a cheap resolution. The coal miners were paid by the ton. So they didn't really care about using safe practices when it just came to uh, getting the most coal and making the most money and getting the most out before someone else could figure out a way to do it. The same thing with the railroads. Guys were literally leaving the cars and applying manual brakes while the train was in motion. And this was leading to just horrible, horrible accidents. That position is called the brake man, and he would be on top of the train as it was moving. And when he hit a certain point, he would apply the brakes. It's like a big wheel at the end of the caboose. Yeah. And then he would jump to the next train car and apply the brake there, and then the next train car and apply the brake. Okay. And eventually, he would work his way up, and it would slow the train down. It was a very dangerous job. Okay. So it was one guy doing the whole, every car one at a time. Yes, and they said that career was roughly, the average was about two years. Oh, man. And they would fall off, and they would be wherever they were. Yeah. (laughs) The train wasn't going to turn around and pick them back up, and they would have to get their way home. (laughs) Right. Oh, man. Well, that's the thing, too, is a lot of inventions came of this because they said we got to improve this system so it's not manual, and that's when the air brake was invented. Yes, the engineer can just break the entire contest with one command from the locomotive. Yeah. So 1908 Workman's Comp, it was a big delay. I mean, we're talking about 60 years, and I think the Civil War partially held that up. I think (laughs) concerns shifted in the united states is something a little different for a while but eventually we got our act together and ever since then it's actually gone better for employees employees have more rights and you know more mandatory training and signs and safety equipment that really leads to a a lot of people going home at the end of the day not disabled or or maimed i feel like the first act that any job took to motivate their employees about safety was just to put that big board up there with the Zero days since a fatal accident has occurred here. <laughs> was it the Simpsons whenever someone was working on that board and they actually slammed their, the hammer into their thumb and it fell down and it was zero again? I do love those boards. Yeah. They just wanted to tick off one more day, but uh, unfortunately that reset the whole clock. So mm-hmm. It's amazing. People will complain about the safety aspect about work. And sometimes for a lot of the companies that I have worked for and in the military as well, they beat it constantly into your head about safety, 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 almost to the point where you're like, this is incredibly annoying. Yeah. But it's hard to put yourself in the shoes of just about a century ago. People were dying a lot. Yeah. It wasn't that uncommon to know somebody who died on the job. Yeah, I get aggravated when I have to listen to a five-minute speech about a safety rule that I'm fading out on, but literally people died. Yeah, people were missing hands, missing limbs and stuff because of on-the-job accidents, too. That was not uncommon to come across. It's important, but it's disguised in a way that the company cares for you, but realistically, it's just cheaper for them if you don't get hurt. Right. Everyone benefits if I don't get hurt. Yeah, morale. You should be safe, but don't tell me you care about my safety because it's money. (laughs) <laughs> it seems weird whenever someone's concerned for me. It's like how the hotels say, let's save Mother Nature and we're we're not going to wash your towels every day. <laughs> it's like, no, that has nothing to do with Mother Nature. You just don't want to spend the money on the laundering. <laughs> well, it's one thing to say, hey, look what happened to uh, Charlie over there. I better not do that again. But, you know, I could see how they don't care about each individual. You're just a number to them. You're a number on the payroll and you're and the statistically chances of you getting hurt are greater if you don't get that training or don't use that equipment. And I'm not delusional to where I think that all these major corporations do care about their people. They care about their numbers and that's fine. It's a beneficial relationship. I work for you. You make money. I get to make money. It's all good. Uh, But there's a third player involved now, OSHA. Right. Who sets regulations that the company has to meet for the employees. Yeah, we needed an entity outside of the company themselves policing themselves. We needed them to be inspected so that safety decisions can be made and the company wouldn't have a bias towards their own costs and their own... Their own ends. Right. The problem is is that in everyday life, we've found a way to essentially surround ourselves with a safer and softer world. 
And there's a lot of jobs out there where that security blanket of not being in danger is taken away. And we seem to forget that our fragile bodies are just a part of this unforgiving physical world. And it's scary. It's scary that something can happen to me. So it's nice to know that even though those OSHA rules might be inconvenient and kind of lame when you have to sit through a training briefing, it's because somebody literally either died or something horrible happened to them. That's usually what led to that safety precaution that's in place. Wearing hard hats is something that I do. And for the most part, the only time I hit my head is because now I'm an extra four inches taller because of this hard hat. And I hit my head because I'm just not used to being that <laughs> tall. <laughs> I know there's been a couple times on certain jobs where something has come back and it tapped my safety glasses right. You know, I obviously flinch because it's coming right at my eye. Yeah. It is a major inconvenience for 95% of the time, but I also have two working eyes still and I haven't been knocked unconscious yet. And there have been issues where I have been hit in the head fairly hard by something and I had a hard hat on and I was very fortunate for it. Yeah. But it can also make it far more expensive for both the company and then that would impact the bottom line for the employees as well. Especially whenever you talk about possibly new equipment that needs to be added to. I see. You sent me one of the more interesting videos I've seen in a long time, and it is for a product called SawStop. Oh, yeah. Would you like to explain kind of what it is and what they did there? Yeah, well, it turns out that table saw accidents are fairly common. And according to their own advertising campaign, 3,000 people a year lose a finger because of table saw accident. Because like I was saying, it's in that unforgiving physical world. So this saw has technology inside that is similar to a touch lamp. You know when you can just turn on your lamp by touching a metal part of it? Mm -hmm. I, my grandma had them, and I feel like everyone's grandma should have had them. Yeah. Grandma things tend to be universal. Everyone's grandma <laughs> has a, a few things, linoleum flooring, a touch lamp. They probably were sold on television infomercials. I bet you that's how every grandma got one. That's true. That's how you knew that you made it back in the 50s, is if you had a touch lamp. Nice. So they use that same technology, and the saw hooks up to that electricity. And if it senses anything conductive, like your skin, it can stop on a dime. Literally, this arm comes out, braces the saw right into position, and it can't move another inch. And it collapses this crumple zone. It ruins the blade and it ruins the uh, module, which contains the crumple zone, because all that energy has to go somewhere. It's violent. It's amazing how violent the action is yeah, and how little to no damage the finger actually incurs. Not even a cut, no blood whatsoever. It's amazing. It was. That was what they led up to, was for the inventor himself to put his own finger on the line. But the initial demonstration was with a hot dog, which is even softer than a finger. And even that didn't get a scratch on it. It was pretty much unscathed. It wouldn't have made it bleed. No, and the man invented it to help get rid of this 10 fingers a day. Somebody's losing an entire two fists full of fingers a day. Yeah. Not one guy, hopefully, but I mean, that would up the average. And it costs thousands of dollars. And the person's not going to be able to work for who knows how long. This module and blade to replace is $60. So you would think companies would jump at this. Now, I thought that the invention was neat. It worked extremely well. But when I searched for it, I saw that he was selling his own saws. Because you need this whole module, this whole breaking system. You have to replace your table saws to have this system. And I thought it was strange that this man was talking about inventing and then he sold them himself. I was wondering why you just wouldn't try to sell it to some of the big saw dealers. Yeah, like Craftsman or something. Yes. And apparently he tried. They weren't interested because of the cost that it would increase their products, which is strange that they didn't even want the option there. But then he did something that kind of turned him into a villain, is that he <laughs> lobbied to make it federal law that this safety feature needed to be on table saws and saws at the workplace. Which would turn the whole construction industry on its side. They would have to have 
flesh detecting safety circuits, I believe is the way that it was worded. And his was the only game in town. This made a lot of hobbyists and companies upset, and it did not go through, but it kind of made him the heel. And he's trying to make money. I totally respect that. And if he's saving fingers, he's saving fingers. But it feels like, well, I'm going to force you to use it. Whether that was his intention or not, that's the route that he took. Yeah. His intentions were obviously good. I see what you're saying, too. It could just be greed. Like, oh, look, I can strong arm all these corporations into being forced to use my mechanism and I'll be rich. But I think his initial motivation was good. He says, you know, all these companies are losing all this money. My invention, they won't. And it's a brilliant invention, and it works amazingly. Yeah. Yeah. It was a five-minute video. It's definitely worth checking out, so I'll stop. You could decide if you're on one side or the other. It would be great to have a saw that just retracts if it senses a finger. It would prevent people from getting hurt, but it would also be expensive. But you would also get the sweet incentives that you get from certain companies for not being hurt. Have you seen safety incentive programs? Have you ever heard of them? Uh, no, I've never been a part. I mean, I've heard of it. I've never been a part of any such pool. It's kind of neat. They obviously vary, but the concept is if you don't get hurt, we will reward you. Yes. Even though not getting hurt should be rewarded in and of itself. But some people, they think they should get pat on the back for, you know, not driving a nail through their hand. But hey, you know, who's going to turn down a gift card, a, you yeah. know, a free trinket, a uh, ice cream, I, whatever the incentive is. <laughs> that makes you feel real grown up. Yeah, you get an ice cream sundae party. <laughs> but there are two types of incentives. Uh huh. There's positive, which is what we just mentioned. And then there's negative, which is basically repercussions for getting hurt. Now, those are illegal. Shame you. Put your picture on the wall with your maimed hand. Yes, getting demoted because you got injured. Those are actually illegal, and then you can be cited by OSHA for those as a company. Okay. The strange thing about the positive reinforcement programs is that OSHA strongly disapproves of the practice as well. But they can't stop it because it's not being negative? Correct, because they're not doing anything legally wrong. Okay. But they have been finding that through the years and the use of these programs— that it is actually leading to more injuries being hidden. If we're working together, yeah, and if we make so many man hours without an injury, we all get a pizza party. If I hurt myself and you see me... Oh. Dude, you're going to mess up our pizza party on Friday. Yeah, just hide it. Just do this, just do that. Or even if it's an individual prize, I'm going to think to myself, well, no, I'm just going to hide it. Because they want their ice cream gift card. Exactly. It's more important, whatever the reward is. Hmm. And basically, employees have an incentive to under-report. I've heard of that before and how the companies are aware that that has negative impacts, but everyone's quiet about it because they still want their trinkets. And it works out for the company, too, because then they have less reportings. Exactly. So it is not really good for the employee in this case. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to keep that in mind, that that's a business practice that I can engage in, and it benefits me, and uh, they get some ice cream. I like it. But there's also incentives to not report, even if there isn't an incentive program, because if there is a low injury or illness rate, there's less chance of being inspected by OSHA. Okay. It decreases the workers' comp expenses. Right. The insurance. People can earn bonuses, and the numbers look good to the public. So it's actually really difficult to get accurate injury numbers whenever there's so many benefits to not reporting correctly. Yeah, yeah. You know how it's considered bad luck to walk under a ladder? Yes. I feel like that was like the first workplace rule that they needed to put a guilt factor in place. (laughs) That's the one superstition I actually believe in because I don't believe it's a superstition. I believe that it's a bad idea (laughs) <laughs> it's just literally an unsafe thing to do. It's bad luck because that's the area where hammers fall from the sky. Yes. Not the other places, just that one place. Or you could kick that one leg off of its support just enough so the whole thing tips over. Yeah. Yeah, I back that superstition. Yeah. That was OSHA's foundation. They built off of that and look at them today. <laughs> <laughs> 
the most common injuries on the job are related to either falling yourself or being struck by something, either falling on you or hitting you. So that's why the hard hat. And I guess when they say struck by an object that's not falling, they must mean like a forklift or something like driving. Yeah, uh, you tripping on something or something in motion hitting you. Oh, yeah. Did you know America's first official hard hat area? No, I, I don't even know what you mean. You mean the first corporation or job that decided to require hard hats? Yes. The hard hat was invented in 1919, and the first hard hat area was the San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge construction site. Oh. That was the first place where if you were on site, you had to have a hard hat on. Gotcha. Okay. Hmm. The first company to make the hard hats, they made a the hard-boiled hat, which was made out of steamed canvas and paint and glue and everything. Hmm. That was the, the Bullard Company, and they're still today making hard hats. Oh, okay. Wow, they got their foot in the door. The hard hat game has been good for them. Yes. And they've had a couple variations, aluminum, fiberglass, but in the 60s, they turned to thermoplastics because it's cheaper. Okay. And yet again, it's sweet vacuum forming. Folks, if you just go on YouTube and watch vacuum forming videos, they are oddly relaxing and oddly satisfying. Yeah. It's like Baby Einstein for adults. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> the last on-the-job related injury that is fairly common is hearing loss. I read that 22 million people work jobs that they are exposed to machinery that operates at such a level that they are at risk for hearing loss. That's a pretty scary statistic that this is something that we all just have to live with. And I'm sure that OSHA has requirements for that, too. I just had my hearing test at work, actually. Yeah. And it's amazing because they will give you this printout. And just like grade school, everyone would get together and look at their grades together. And <laughs> it was amazing because I did extremely well. Apparently, I can hear a mouse taking a pee on a cotton ball. Wow. But my buddy, his was terrible. Everyone was looking around like everyone was pretty good. And his numbers were just horrific. And we're like, we all feel bad. It's like, he's clearly almost deaf. Yeah. It's okay, bro. So, <laughs> sorry. We have to talk louder to him now. Yeah. Uh, but they give you these little foam earplugs. That's all you get. But they're amazing how much they can do. How much they block the discomfort. Yes. And yeah. uh, I, I, I I hate to sound like <laughs> safety is really super important because I hear that every day at work and I don't believe the people telling me, but it is. It actually, it really is. Yeah. But the guy that... Could not hear very well. He is a firearms enthusiast. Okay. So it wasn't job related, his hearing loss. Uh, and certainly his hobby doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't bode well for him getting a big settlement. No. I'm, I'm, it's kind of hard to hide the fact. I don't fire those guns. They're very quiet. <laughs> I have a silencer on all of them. <laughs> 50 cal. Yes. But I found <laughs> that there are earplugs just for hunting. And... It makes sense because of the loud bangs. Yeah. But that's not where these things stop. So these earplugs are formed to your ear, as in like you get a cast made and they get put in your ears. Yeah, personalized. Yes. There is an amplifier in them. So you hear better. So you can hunt or track or whatever you do. But whenever a loud noise occurs, it will immediately cut off sound to your ears. And then once the sound is gone, it'll amplify back up. Yeah. So you could hear a chipmunk running 50 feet away and you can shoot your rifle, not hear it that well. And then you could hear it again because you missed. I was very impressed with them. Yeah. You know what? I never thought of that. There's this catch-22 that hunters run into where they want to protect their ears, but you can't be an effective hunter when you're not in tune with your environment either. I didn't even think about the need for that. So so that's an electronic device that switches off the amplifier when it hears a loud noise? Yes. What a great idea. Wish I thought of that. And that's one of the problems whenever I do work is I can't hear people talk. I can't hear certain environmental problems around me. Yeah, the crash booms and bangs are, are subdued, but... If someone drops a hammer behind me, I don't hear it. I turn around and I trip on the hammer. Yeah. You have to take the good with the bad whenever you're using a little foam earplug that is a quarter of a penny. Yeah, if somebody says heads up, you need to hear that too. Exactly. But 
now you can buy earplugs that just play looped sounds to cancel out environmental noise. So you can, it, this is for like office workers. Okay. So you don't hear paper shuffling. Distractions. Yes. Yeah. So you can listen to white noise and everything. And that's like the exact opposite of what I want. Some people are just trying to listen to cut themselves out of reality. and <laughs> But whenever you're in an industry where you're swinging large pieces of metal around, you kind of want to pay attention to your environment a little better. You know, I read this other statistic that 92% of work-related fatalities are men. Go big and go home, man. That's what it is. <laughs> but you know what? Before we put a feather in our, in our man cap, uh, there's still... <laughs> Eight percent of these ladies are dying doing what? I don't know. These poor, poor ladies. They're like, why couldn't I have just been a secretary? Why did I have to work in this factory? But yeah, that's a meme where you'll see like, this is why guys don't live as long. And you'll see like a ladder that's just precariously placed on two two by fours across a stairwell. Yeah. And it's like, I'm not going to be able to feed my family tomorrow if we don't get this <laughs> job done today. So I can't bear to live another day and not feed my family. So I might as well risk my life. But see, a lot of those memes are people at home. I know some of those can't be at work. There's no way. Right. Like the guy who gets on all fours so he could be the table for the handsaw. Yes. Uh, and I think about it like I have to eventually paint the walls on my stairwell. Yeah. And I have to sit there and I really have to think, how am I going to reach up there? I can't put a ladder on here. I have to rent something? <laughs> I, I have to figure out what terrible choice I have to make. Absolutely. So the, the the home is extremely dangerous as well. Oh, yeah. And falls are still chief among injuries at home. But the other one I found was fire. One of the most likely ways to get hurt and die at home is a fire, unfortunately. And the numbers are way down from what they used to be, too, thanks to the smoke detector. Oh, yeah. I did some reading about the smoke detector. And the uh, inventor of the ionization smoke detector, there, since the first smoke detector, there's been a few more models introduced. But the original smoke detector was invented by a guy named Walter Yeager. And it's got one of those funny stories where it was an accident. He originally was trying to develop something that would alert people if there was poisonous gas present. And I couldn't find what gas he was testing it with. But he had it set up so that there was a current going through, and if the gas was present, it would dip the electricity in the circuit, and he would see it on a needle. Okay. And he was experimenting with this, and it was not working out, and he literally gave up and sat down and lit a cigarette. <laughs> and <laughs> within a few seconds, he realized that the uh, smoke was affecting the needle, and he saw that what he had invented was essentially a smoke detector. So he did okay for himself. So what you're telling me is that a cigarette literally saved hundreds of thousands of lives. Yes. That's marketing right there. It doesn't really shift the percentage of how many they have killed, but let's claim the good with the good. We've saved a lot too. <laughs> yes, this is man having a stress cigarette because of his failure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we've all been there. Oh, man. Yeah, and then and then since then, there's the carbon monoxide detector as well, which I guess is what? Like your furnace is malfunctioning or you forgot to uh, make sure that your chimney's clear. How do you get carbon monoxide in your house? Is it just basically your furnace not ventilating properly? The problem with carbon monoxide is that it was heavier than air. So say you had a carbon monoxide leak in your basement and you didn't know about it. And you go downstairs and you're walking around and legitimately it could be at your chest level and you wouldn't know. You'd be breathing just fine. Okay. But then you go and tie your shoe and all of a sudden you'll pass out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the problem is if you're passed out, you're still in the area where it's... You're going to breathe in more carbon monoxide and, and not make it. And if somebody sees you, they're going to go down to check you out and all of a sudden they're going to pass out. So carbon monoxide is... It's tricky like that where... There are a lot of common household systems, like your furnace, that will produce it. But usually you're just pumping it outside where it's not going to really affect anything. Yeah. But it, it, it's very dangerous for, like, firefighters that are, unless they have their uh, breathing apparatuses in, they can get susceptible to it because it's colorless, it's odorless. And if you are sniffing it, you're losing oxygen to the brain. Yes. Your breaths are in vain. <laughs> oh, man. What a way to go. 
one of the other things I came across was there's this company that makes wet floor signs. And wet floor signs were another thing that became regulated. What happened was businesses were being held liable for injuries from their customers, not necessarily even their employees. But if there was a spill in aisle five and a customer slips on it, now they're saying, okay, you owe me money because you were negligent. You left this mess there, knowing full well that that would make the floor slippery. I'm just trying to (laughs) spend some money here, and now it's a hazard. (laughs) (laughs) So the businesses counteracted this by saying, okay, it's our responsibility. We can't avoid wetness 100%, but what we can do is put a caution sign out so that the customers can be sufficiently warned of the danger. And there was debate over that as to, you know, what color to use, if if there should be words on it at all, or if it should just be a picture, the height of it, because the original A-frame, I think, is only two feet high, where there's also this cone type thing that I think is uh, 32 inches high or something. Okay, yeah. They obviously settled on yellow. We know that today. Mm -hmm. But what happened was people were filing counter lawsuits because the businesses started to leave the signs out, whether the floor was wet or dry, because it was just a lazy factor of if I'm required to have a wet floor sign, people should just always be careful. Mm -hmm. And customers started to become used to walking around them and them being just a fixture in the aisle. It became not a warning anymore. It became a part of the environment. So there's this company that has created what they think is a solution. It's a wet floor sign shaped like an upside down banana peel, like in Mario Kart. (laughs) It's nice and bright and yellow, and it's taller than the A-frame. I don't know if they're stackable. I mean, (laughs) that might be inconvenient, but you can't miss it. It would have to be. Yeah, they have to be stackable so you can put them away nicely. I think that's important, too. That company would be missing out on something really impressive if they didn't make it stackable. Well, it wasn't one of their bullets, so I I don't know. (sighs) But yeah, it was definitely noticeable. And they were saying, you know, any age would know any language. This is like a universal slippery floor sign. I thought it was a good idea. Thank you, Charlie Chapman. (laughs) He really brought awareness. I assume he, I mean, if I had to group one person into making me aware that banana pills are slippery, which I don't think they are. Oh, they are. I don't, I don't know. If you take a banana peel and you put it the slimy side down and you step on it with your shoe, your shoe will grip on that outside and that you, you will be airborne, my friend. Oh, wow. Put a YouTube video of you doing it in the show notes. Uh, no, not going to happen. I just <laughs> I just wouldn't be good with the sound effects with the... the whoop. <laughs> Apparently, I'm good at making. The, <laughs> reconfirmation that... The banana peel is indeed a hazard. Charlie Chaplin was not full of shit. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, I love it. I think that's a great idea because when you're in a factory setting or something where you could possibly be in danger, they use yellow for painting, you know, painting your walkways. Yellow is the go-to. And when you see it all the time, you just learn to ignore it. When everything is yellow, it's like highlighting the important thing in the paragraph. But at the end, the entire paragraph was important. So it's all highlighted. (laughs) Yeah. So I just should have put like a star next to it. Yeah, exactly. So I respect the company that is doing something a little different. Yeah. Do they have to be all universal? Do they have to have the same thing? I, I, I like people who are inventive. Right. It's almost better if there's variety because it gets your attention more. Yes. That happens at hospitals, too. There's so many warning sounds Mm -hmm. that the doctors have to listen to on all that equipment if the IV bag is empty, if the heart rate drops below this. And they have this alarm fatigue where they don't know which ones are important anymore and they can't hear them all. I haven't done too many stays at a hospital, but there's nothing like a spike in anxiety when one of your machines start beeping. (laughs) Even though you have no idea what it possibly could mean, yeah, your heart rate just jumps up, which makes another machine beep, which makes you even more anxious. Yeah, there's no way that you can feel comfortable if you hear your machine basically summoning someone immediately. <laughs> it's like, well, I have two minutes to live. Yeah. There's never a gentle beep. So would the fix action for that be less like like does it have to get really bad for it to be just different kinds of beeps? i think maybe they, they need more beeps like you know they need like a auga just for the major emergencies <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> and then the little clown horn for uh, just check me every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, and like some things could be calming, like the Windows startup sound. You know, they could use that. That's a good feeling. Whenever we talk about standardization, when you mentioned with the different buzzers and beeping of what, what they all could mean, when I think of standardized safety, I think of the in-flight videos. Oh, yeah. When you take a flight and they have to show you how to buckle your seatbelt. But like for years, they were standardized. Mm-hmm. And now it's the cool thing to be completely wacky and zany with them. Well, yeah. I'm still not going to care. I'm going to tell you that right now. I'm still not going to listen. I don't care. What if he wraps it? What if the guy wraps the whole in-flight demonstration? Come on. I don't care. My name is Tom, and I'm here to say... Please insert the flat buckle into the... It's... I know. And Seinfeld's been ripping on that for 40 years now, so I understand we're not breaking any new ground here. But you would think that, just like when you have to start a new job, you have to watch a couple of training videos. And those are always cheesy as can be. Uh, The music is bad, the production is bad, the acting is bad, the sound quality is bad. (laughs) Wait, I'm sorry, I I, I faded out. Are you talking about our first releases on YouTube? (laughs) Talking about the YouTube exclusives, yeah? (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, the quality is low when you're doing something new, yes. So you would think that the airlines would have followed suit with something like that, some standard training video, but obviously they want individuals to make eye contact with the passengers and say, I want to make sure that everybody's engaged here because this is actually important. Now, I'm not saying that it's actually important, especially the seatbelt part. And the other part that I'm going to criticize is uh, some of the reading I found, the oxygen masks that fall and you go, oh, okay, we lose cabin pressure. I'll still be able to breathe. The ones that must inflate, correct? (laughs) No, they will make it clear to you every time see you keep zoning out (laughs) it is still functioning properly even if the bag doesn't inflate oh i have to put my child's on first right (laughs) yes make sure your little child's lungs can uh, get oxygen before yourself absolutely and then you put it on yourself your games don't work on me i'll show you i'll ignore your safety (laughs) tips even though i have no idea what i would do in a crash one time i had a pilot who thought he was clever they were telling everybody to shut off their devices and I guess to um, you know raise the insecurities on the plane, he said, and I know that not all of you have turned off your devices. I can see right now, according to my blah, 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 whatever he said, there's an iPad, there's a Dell laptop, and there's even a TI-89 calculator. And I was like, oh, you just lost me, man. I know that you're full of baloney. Yeah. I know that TI doesn't connect to anything. Yeah. Uh, I had one of those when I was taking pre-calc, and I wished it would have had some Wi-Fi. Did you stand up and call bollocks and then suggest a mutiny? (laughs) I should have, man. I should have. You know what? This is a post-9-11 world we were living in. Yeah, that's true. So the bags that don't inflate. Oh, yeah. They are for whenever you lose cabin pressure. And I would assume that the air would be super thin. Yes. It's just like when you climb um, a mountain too high, if you're not used to that ratio. Yes. When I watch a movie of a mountain climber, (laughs) I know what you're talking about because I'm not doing that. (laughs) Okay. Relate to the movie then. (laughs) Don't worry about the fact of all the other mountains I've scaled. I don't mean to intimidate. (laughs) No, but I read that those masks actually have never been proven to have saved a life or the lack of those masks has never been proven to uh, have been responsible for loss of life. I found that hard to believe because, I mean, literally every plane is equipped with them. And it makes me wonder if it's just like a placebo effect. I mean, you're obviously going to have trouble breathing no matter what. I'm going to totally disagree. I I think the second that those bags drop, you're starting panic. Oh, yeah. I think that it would have more of a negative effect. Yeah. If those bags aren't doing something, they shouldn't even drop. Okay. Okay. It gives you something to focus on while you're suffocating. (laughs) Let's give someone something to do so they don't panic. Oh, you may die. Put this on your (laughs) face. Well, I think the point is that faster than everyone can get a mask on, the pilot can just descend to an appropriate level where the air is okay in a fairly quick amount of time that, that you wouldn't die of oxygen starvation, I guess is the point. No, 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 no. See, what it is is the quicker you put the mask on, the less you can talk and scream, causing more panic. Oh. The bag doesn't inflate until you fill it with your own terrified screams. 
Oh, that's good. There's just one more thing I stumbled across, and I thought it was really a good idea, and um, I think I'm going to start doing it. Out of all the things that I saw that were safety-related that were like, oh, yeah, I guess that's important, I saw a suggestion to keep your car's remote that you can unlock your doors with Mm -hmm. on your nightstand. And that way, if you find that there's an intruder in the night, you can press the panic button and kind of alert the whole neighborhood in one moment that there's a problem at your house. Even if they don't know exactly what that problem is, it'll draw attention. Someone might call the police. And I I thought that was a really good idea to not just be stuck in your room, you know, wondering like who's downstairs, what's going on, but but you can actually... uh, take charge of the situation and i thought that was good advice i feel bad for every car alarm that i ignored in the night now (laughs) in your neighborhood that would be a big red flag you act like you live in like the south side of dc or something (laughs) if you hear a car alarm i feel like you should be doing something doesn't your mom live like a block away do you think it's jim over there it must be jim's car i hope he's okay you know his mom isn't doing so great no it's it's not like that (laughs) okay but it's, I guess it's, it's a little closer than, you know, yeah. Harlem. So. All right, Paul. Well, it is a hot summer night and my air conditioner has been off. So I think I'm going to call it a night. But I would like to invite everybody who is listening to us to subscribe to our ground radio show. Yes. Search our show and subscribe. That way you can get alerts every single time that we release a new one. We aim for bi-weekly. Yes, we're still aiming for every other week a new release. Uh, Sometimes, you know, it's not going to work out. And with this lackadaisical summer schedule, I'm sure you'll understand. Yes. In in the winter, I'm far more productive, so we will put more out in the winter. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, we're we're just stuck in the house. But please, send us a message on Facebook. You you can catch us on YouTube. You can catch me on Twitter, sort of. I'm on there. I tweet. I'm not very good at it. Yeah. But if you want to send me a message and maybe teach me how to tweet, go right ahead. Yeah. Retweet our automatic tweets and you'll inspire us to original tweet. (laughs) If it looks like a robot's tweeting it, that's kind of accurate. Yeah. (laughs) But I try to throw a little personal flair every once in a while on there. But, you know, this newfangled technology. But we appreciate it. All right, Z. Well, this was a good one. I uh, enjoyed it. And uh, we'll talk soon. All right. Be safe.